No matter how far into the human past historians look, they find evidence that our ancestors were very interested in distant lands, their peoples, and societies. Was this urge toward discovery a purely practical desire for useful objects and practices? Was it simple curiosity or maybe just the lusting for exotic ornaments from afar? Current historical research doesn't really provide an answer, but historians do know that by the year 400 before the Common Era, nomadic and sedentary peoples certainly were trading with each other. And as soon as commodities began to change hands, so did less tangible but more lasting items of exchange. Religions, languages, literature, philosophies, artistic designs, music, and political ideas were all conveyed along with silk, gold, and spices. Both land and sea routes flourished as conduits of early culture and commerce, at least as early as the 3rd millennium BCE. Few if any travelers or merchants made the entire Indian journey on these roads and waterways. Goods typically changed hands numerous times along the way. Today, modern highways are being built across Africa and Asia. However, trade and interaction between the continents of Asia, Africa, Europe, and parts of Oceania has been going on for millennia. The exchange of goods between people of different biological zones is a major feature of human history. At various times, items such as silk have been monopolized by other societies. Long distance trade became more important than ever in the years following 500 to 1500 in the Common Era. The creation of a network of communication and exchange spread across the Afro-Eurasian world and a separate wave in parts of the Americas. Change altered consumption, encouraged specialization, and sometimes diminished economic self-sufficiency of local societies. Often traders became a distinct social group while trading sometimes was a means of social mobility. Traded goods provided prestige goods for elites and sometimes the wealth from trade motivated state creation. Religious ideas, technological innovations, plants and animals, and disease also spread along the trade routes. The Silk Road's exchange across Eurasia traveled along the inner and outer zones with different ecologies. Outer Eurasia is relatively warm, well watered. China, India, Middle East, and Mediterranean areas. Inner Eurasia has a harsher, drier climate. Much of it is pastoral. That would be Eastern Russia and Central Asia. These trading networks did best when large states provided security for trade. It was the Roman and Chinese empires who first established commerce along the Silk Roads. In the 7th and 8th centuries, the Byzantine Empire Abbasid dynasty and Tong dynasty created a belt of strong states and in the 13th and 14th centuries Mongol Empire controlled almost the entirety of the Silk Roads. A vast array of goods traveled along the Silk Roads often by camel. At first trade consisted mostly of luxury goods for the elite as the high cost of transport did not allow movement of staple goods. Silk came to symbolize the Eurasian exchange system. At first China had a monopoly on silk technology. But by the 6th century, other peoples produced silk as well. Silk was used in place of money in Central Asia, and silk was a symbol of high status. The volume of trade was small, but still was important economically and socially. Cultural transmission was more important than exchange of goods. Buddhism spread along Silk Roads through Central and East Asia, where it had always appealed to merchants. Conversion to Buddhism was heavy in the oasis cities of Central Asia, where the peasant farming peoples were attracted to the fact that conversion was voluntary. Many of the Central Asian cities became centers of learning and commerce. However, Buddhism spread much more slowly among the Central Asian pastoralists. In China, Buddhism was the religion of foreign merchants, or rulers for centuries, and Buddhism was transformed during its spread. The major population centers of the Afro-Eurasian world developed characteristic disease patterns and ways to deal with them. Long distance trade meant exposure to unfamiliar diseases. Early examples of the disease following the Silk Roads was the epidemic in Athens in 430 to 429 before the Common Era. During the Roman and Han Empire, smallpox and measles devastated both populations. 
Perhaps the best example of the trade of the disease along the route can be demonstrated by the bubonic plague that traveled from India and ravished the Mediterranean worlds between the years 534 and 750 CE. The Black Death spread thanks to the Mongol Empire's unification of much of Eurasia in the 13th and 14th centuries. The Black Death could have been bubonic plague, anthrax, or a collection of epidemic diseases. The deadly effects of the disease killed one-third of the European population between 1346 and 1350. The Europeans weren't the only ones to suffer, as a similar death toll in China and parts of the Islamic world occurred in the same period. The Central Asian steppes were badly affected and the disease helped to undermine Mongol power. However, the disease exchange would give the Europeans a distinct advantage when they reached the Western Hemisphere after 1500. The Mediterranean Sea was an avenue for commerce from the time of the Phoenicians. The Italian city of Venice was a center of commerce by 1000 CE and controlled trade of imports from Asia. Venice linked Europe to the much greater trade network of the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean network was the world's most important trade route after 1500. Indian Ocean trade grew from environmental and cultural diversity, and transportation was cheaper by sea than by land. Commerce in the Indian Ocean area was made possible thanks to alternating wind currents known as monsoons. Early commerce was conducted between towns, not states. The origins of Indian Ocean trade lay in the age of the first civilizations. Indus Valley writing may have been stimulated by cuneiform as the ancient Egyptians and Phoenicians traded up and down the Red Sea coast. Groups of Malay sailors reached Madagascar in the first millennium BCE, and the tempo of commerce increased in early centuries CE with greater understanding of the monsoons. As trade centers continued to be added, merchants from the Roman Empire settled in southern India and the East African coast, and growing trade existed in the eastern Indian Ocean Basin and South China Sea. The main force of trade expansion was India. The two great encouragers for the Indian Ocean Exchange were the economic and political revival of China and the rise of the Islamic faith in the 7th century CE. Ocean commerce transformed Southeast Asia and East Africa as trade stimulated political change and introduced foreign religious ideas. Southeast Asia is located between China and India and this made it important as a center of trade on the Indian Ocean routes. Malay sailors opened up an all-sea route between India and China through the Straits of Malacca around 350 CE and led many small ports to compete to attract traders. The Malay Kingdom of Sri Yava emerged from competition and dominated trade from 670 to 1025 in Common Era. The temptation of gold, access to spices and taxes on ships provided resources to create a state, while local beliefs such as the idea that chiefs possessed magical powers created unique religious practices in the Malay Kingdom. Its leaders directed the massive building of Hindu and Buddhist centers in the 8th through 10th centuries. This building frenzy demonstrates Buddhist cultural grounding in Javanese customs. In Burma, the Khmer state of Angkor still reflected Indian culture even as Islam penetrated later. The Swahili civilization of East Africa developed from a blend of Bantu with the commercial life of the Indian Ocean, especially the rise of the Islamic faith. Growing demand for East African products such as gold, ivory, quartz, leopard skins, some slaves, iron, wood products, all reflect that an African merchant class developed with towns and kinships. Swahili civilization flourished on the East African coast between 1000 and 1500 CE. This civilization was very urban with cities of around 1500 to 18,000 people and each city was politically independent, ruled by a king. This civilization accumulated goods from the interior and traded for Asian goods and also developed sharp class distinctions. Most of their trade was in Arab ships and Swahili craft traveled coastal waterways with deep participation in the Indian Ocean world. It experienced regular visits by Arab, Indian, and perhaps Persian merchants, and some of them even settled there. Many ruling families claimed Arab or Persian origins, and Swahili was written in Arabic script with the Arabic loanwords. 
the Swahili experienced widespread conversion to Islam, but Islam and Swahili culture didn't reach much beyond the coast until the 19th century. However, the Swahili region traded with the interior and had an impact as trade occurred with the interior for gold and also led to the emergence of Great Zimbabwe which flourished in the years 1250 through 1350 in the Common Era.